Good morning, Malta and Goto, and welcome to another episode of Love and Daily. My name is John Potsapati. Today I'm joined by Tim Diakono, and these are your five headlines for today. The Georgios told to contact Europol after Brussels says it won't be intervening in pardon. Malta has seized cocaine worth up to 100 million from banana boxes en route to Slovenia. Portugal has finally began to bounce back as life, uh, to life as staff shortages remains a problem. Malta's top Olympic prospect won't participate in Tokyo due to injuries. And the Maltese woman makes history at UN leading first all-female committee. Make sure to stick around to the end where we'll have an interview with Andrea Camilleri, Executive EU Fund from Servizi Europe for Malta, formerly known as Muzak, where he'll be discussing um, EU-funded projects and how you can apply. Yeah, so uh, first story, Daphne Kwan Galizia murder suspects Alfred and George De Giorgio have been um, denied an intervention by the European Commission for Justice um, in, in their you know, request or their attempts to, to obtain some kind of presidential pardon. So the Georgios recently appealed to the EU uh, that the, the government isn't giving them a pardon and they're you know, complaining that the person they're trying to implicate uh, one of whom, the people they're trying to implicate, one of whom is not in the murder itself but in other crimes is Minister Carmel Obel and that the government is compromised because um, the minister is part of the same cabinet, which is going to decide whether or not they're going to get a pardon or not. However, um, predictably, the, the EU refused to intervene, rightfully so, yeah. because otherwise it's not so going to say meddling into other countries' decisions on who to give a pardon to and who not to give a pardon to, and they referred the case to, to Europol. So, yeah, that's a, another... Um, Avenue blocked for the the, the, the Giorgio brothers, uh, and we we'll have to see what 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 the next the next step will be. Obviously, it's it's not an it isn't an easy debate because if they have, you know, information you know serious information on major crimes, it's important that the police find out what it is, and um, you know and the rest and arrest these people and charge them, especially if they're in high positions of power, then again, they shouldn't allow themselves to be used as some kind of plating by two career criminals. Career criminals don't belong on the streets, they belong in a prison cell. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, the brothers, and along with Vince Kohlmuskat, have been charged with killing multi journalists Daphne Kawana and Galizia in 2017. The person in question, uh, Carmelo Abella and Chris Cardona, um, have been the names have been thrown around the past few weeks, as well as specifically with the HSBC, HSBC heist in 2010, and uh, Cardona with regards to being involved in an apparent failed 20, 2015 plot to murder the journalist at the time. Moving on to our second story, and now concerning a historic um, drug bust, uh, as Malta has seized cocaine worth up to 100 million euros coming from banana boxes which were en route to Slovenia. Customs officials intercepted a whopping 740 kilograms of cocaine with an estimated street value of 90 to 100 million euros last night. And it came from a reefer container that was making its way from Ecuador to Slovenia. Um, and apparently these cocaine packets and such were found in banana boxes while the majority of bananas were, were, were clean. Some customers sifted through all of them and found that in fact um, 37, 37, of the 700, 37 of them contained 740 packets of a white substance later confirmed to be high purity cocaine. It is a new record um, cocaine haul for customs breaking the record last December when officials seized 612 kilograms of the drug, again passing from Ecuador and Colombia but this time to Libya. Yeah. What I found interesting about this was the way uh, customs managed to find the cocaine. So in their statement, they said that there was some kind of random check on this reefer container. They didn't say what led them to suspect it. But then they found out that, that, um, that some of the, of the boxes weighed a little bit more than some of the others. And the reason that was, was because uh, they had cocaine inside them. But this is, uh, this is the new technology that they have implemented that makes it not impossible, but more difficult for uh, drugs to, to, to come into Malta when, um, to, via the Freeport en route to other countries. So it's, it's obviously going to be frustrating some very serious criminals um, overseas. 
mean um, moving on Parcheville, Malta's old night life haven is starting to feel like its old self once more after Malta lifted its COVID-19 restrictions or partially lifted them on the COVID-19 restrictions on bars people started flocking to Parcheville, quite a lot of people actually over the past few days and um, the the bar owners uh, rightfully so are feeling you know, quite rejuvenated that they can finally work again and that there's finally some light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. However, there are still several restrictions that in, in play, specifically people aren't allowed to dance or mingle together. So previous nightclubs, famous ones like Havana, have now become lounges with DJs literally stopping the music when, 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 when the clients start to dance. So that's <laughs> dancing not allowed. They have to close at midnight. Yeah. It's just often when you know, the, the pot, yeah, go the, out. <laughs> that's that's not exactly that's when that's, the party starts. Exactly, so that's that's you know that's gone and now it's, they have to close at midnight, and there are other restrictions, such as the fact that you have to wear a mask, mm -hmm. the fact that you have to uh, the tables have to be that there's table service, so you can't just go to the bar and order a drink. Yeah. It's and they also have a bit of a staffing problem, as we've discussed this issue before. Um, there's a lack of 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 labour. In the in the market, due to the fact that foreign workers, ha many of them were kicked out of Malta uh, or, or, or left voluntarily during the pandemic, and so there's a lack of staff, and they also need to hire more staff to cater to you know to to properly implement these yeah. new restrictions. Yeah. So they're in a very tight situation. It's good that they're finally working again, but it's clearly not sustainable. Yeah. And it, not sustainable for some for some clubs and and bars to even open again, considering the high costs. Um, it, it would incur on them, given that they need to implement these, you know, new restrictions, hire more staff and whatnot. It, for some, it's not even worth it. But it's a, uh, you know, it's good to see that Patchwood is going to come back to life, especially considering the fact that over the past two weeks there have been reports of people taking to the promenade and streets and beaches of Slim and St Julian's to, to, to party in, at, late at night, um, you know, causing, being quite disruptive to the residents in the area, but also, um, you know, breaking. COVID-19 protocols and restrictions by mass gatherings and also leaving litter and pollution on the beach day after. Um, um, it's believed that you know, this was caused by the fact that places like Patrick were closed, so these people couldn't go there to party, but now that it's open, hopefully we see a shift back to some sense of normality. Moving on to our fourth story, and uh, quite a heartbreaking one, knowing that Malta's top Olympic prospect, Jordan Guzman, won't be participating in Tokyo this summer due to the fact that he's suffering a number of Injuries. Um, Guzman took to uh, social media the other day to announce that um, unfortunately he won't be making the trip to Tokyo. He was considered to be Malta's top athlete, a middle distance runner who currently has the world national record in the 1.5 meters, 1,500 meters, 3,000 and 500 meters here in Malta. Um, unfortunately, he won't be going. Out of all athletes, he's took the best chance of actually qualifying for the Olympics. He's supposed to be giving a wild card. Um, and it's unfortunate that, in fact, he won't be wearing the multi singlet when he goes to uh, in Tokyo. Um, he was formerly um, Australia's 5,000 meter champion before he switched allegiances and uh, wore the multi singlet in honor of his late grandfather. He was um, put on quite a show at the 2019 Games of the Small State, where he won gold in the 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters, becoming the first Maltese person to do so in history. It's just a shame to see that, you know, such a talented athlete who is actually 27 years old, so the next time he would go to the Olympics, he'd be 30, um, isn't able to participate given that, you know, he's had such a strong record, but unfortunately injuries take his toll on the body and he's just not in a fit position to make it to Tokyo. Yeah, it's, it's not been an easy ride for athletes. They've, their training schedules have been completely disrupted by the pandemic and the constantly changing restrictions. The Olympics is obviously a big goal for any athlete to the biggest, uh, to the biggest. and there's obviously from from Malta's perspective there's still um there's still a huge record to break which is the fact that you know someone one day will become the first Maltese athlete to win a, a, an, an Olympic yeah. medal um unfortunately it won't be him but best of luck to all the other athletes who will who will participate in the Olympics and um, finally some good news from the diplomatic front Maltese diplomat Vanessa Frazier has been elected chairperson of the Economic and Financial Committee within the United Nations. So this is quite an influential committee that deals with economic policies such as um, sustainable development targets and climate change targets for different countries, but also touches on issues such as um, 
such as the Palestine and Israel mm -hmm. conflict. And uh, it, you know, besides the fact that she was appointed to this, uh, elected, sorry, to this, to this role, she also decided to make a statement and lobby for this committee to be the first in the United Nations history to be completely compo composed of, of women. And she was successful. So she's going to be chairing a committee that's fully composed of women. And mm -hmm. she said she did this, she spoke to Love and Walt about this, she said she wants to break the glass ceiling. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I mean, I can't, I've, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really in favor of this kind of, of approach to gender equality, but I mean, it's, I, it's still good to see uh, Maltese women making their, you know, making their voices heard on the, inter on the largest international stage as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also a, a sign and to other Maltese people exactly. that, you know, just because you're from a small island, it doesn't mean that you have to be limited. Exactly. So, so the glass ceiling is not just for uh, women, it's also for exactly. Maltese people. Exactly, it's not just Maltese women, it's Malta. In general, in fact, this is the highest elected UN position held by a Maltese diplomat and by a Maltese woman. The only time Malta held a higher position was when Guido de Marco was elected United Nations General Assembly President in 1990. So incredible feat and wish you all the best of luck. With that being said, this brings us to the end of our news segment. Make sure to stick around where we'll be talking with Andrea Camilleri, Executive EU Fund from Servizi Europe Malta, formerly known as MUSAC. But before that, we're going to show a quick video, in fact, of an EU-funded project called Play Football, Live Football that Malta recorded last year. Live Football, Play Football is a project of the Malta Football Association, which is EU-funded. This is the third project of its kind aimed at bringing communities together. In this case, it's refugees within a Maltese community. We work with a great number of football clubs in Malta and Gozo, Marisa Zeytun, Birza Buja, Birkirkara, and new clubs like Sanat in Gozo. program means a lot to me and I've created so many groups to make sure that we have a great organization that we can play good football because football is one of the utmost priority that I would not like to leave. I believe that someday I'm gonna be in a bigger team that will be more famous. Because football is, football is my best sport. The final objective is to have at least five amateur teams playing in the amateur leagues. Today is my first time to visit this place to play the football. Well, I so feel so somehow excited. Really, the training was so nice with me. I like it here because the people that I've met so far, they are good to me and we are getting along quite well and they don't discriminate in terms of football. If you look very well, you see. I'm very happy to be back today to, the, to this training because last year I did enjoy it very well. We played very well last year and we do everything as a team. Mr. Peter who introduced me to the MFA and uh, I started coaching like giving them some small sessions. This year I would really like like to share my talent uh, just to encourage the young um, footballers. They don't necessarily have to be the best teams in the world but they are the best teams in the world in their spirit and the fact that they are together in doing something and their, their objective on the field is obviously to score a goal and their objective beyond the field is obviously a better society, better communities and better integration.
Welcome back to Love and Daily. We're now joined by Andrea Camilleri, Executive EU Fund from Servizio Europei for Malta, formerly known as MUSAC. Uh, SEM helps make the European Union more accessible to citizens in Malta and Gozo, as well as kind of uh, makes it easier for citizens to reap benefits from EU mm. membership, uh, specifically EU funds. I think a lot of people are familiar with the term USAC and our understanding of what it is, but you recently went under, uh, you did a, had a rebrand, mm -hmm. and now you're known as SEM. For those who don't know, what is SEM and what kind of what are some of the functions you So, provide? Service Europe of Malta, are, uh, we are a government agency. Um, we've been operating since 2008 um, under a different name, which was, which was MUSAC, the Malta mm -hmm. EU Steering and Action Committee. Um, uh, we try, our focus is to be this one stop shop on anything that relates to EU, EU affairs and primarily the main goal of the whole agency is to provide this information to citizens um, in Malta and Gozo when it comes to anything related to the EU. So right. we try to provide this information on, uh, let's say, different policies which are being, going to be implemented. Um, we, we constantly kept citizens up to date on what the EU is doing with regards to the COVID situation. Um, but then we also specialize on EU funding. And uh, when it comes to EU funding, we go beyond just the provision information, but we also look to provide services which are more hands-on with the needs that many organizations in Malta have. So um, when it comes to EU funding... So we when we say EU funding, right, mm. we're talking about um, projects in Malta that can mm. benefit from these, this, this EU funding yes. opportunities, from these calls, uh -huh. right? So we, we try first, we, we target, our main target, our targets are different organizations which, which are focused on NGOs, um, local public bodies, so local councils, and then pub the public sector in general, so different government agencies and government ministries. We also focus on public schools. Um, and so when it comes to these organizations, what we do is we try, we promote different funding opportunities which they might be interested in. And we also try to engage with them to see what project ideas they have in mind. And once they, have, once, um, they come up to us with a project idea that we, that we can find a proper call mm -hmm. that matches that project idea, we start what, what we call the project development phase. So we, ho we do a number of meetings with them. We start to structure their project um, with them according to the call that we would have found, that would, would have matched their project idea. Once the project has been structured, such as the activities right. and uh, all these aspects, um, we start the project application phase. So then um, the application phase for EU funding, it is a bit of a daunting task. There are a lot of um, different things which organizations need to do. And unfortunately for many organizations and more, especially NGOs, um, at times uh, they, do, they do not manage to um, successfully ap apply. So what we do is we take a hands-on approach where we actually help them with the filling in of the application form. So once the project has been developed and, we've, and we see that the project is a strong project that can fit in with the application, we start the application, we help um, uh, with filling in the application. We, get some, we also look to get some assistance from the organization itself to fill in some certain sections, but we also fill in sections ourselves. Once the application has been developed, um, and we feel that it's a strong application that has a good chance of being, pro of being uh, rewarded with funding, um, uh, that is submitted to either the managing authorities in Malta, which manage your funds locally, but also we also try to encourage um, local organizations to apply with funding which is managed by the Commission at a right. new level. So then those projects are competing at a new level with other organizations across the EU. And we have also been successful um, with a number of organizations that do get rewarded with these large competitive calls. So, so okay, so just to kind of break it down, um, throughout the year the EU releases a number of calls for yes. funding for projects. People in Malta, um, organizations, NGOs, public schools, local councils, can benefit from this by filling out, by applying, and you facilitate that process by, by for out reaching out to them, yes. providing support, providing details, information, and even going through the fact, going through them with the application process if if, yes. need, if need be. Kind of, what are some examples of mm -hmm. successful projects that have been implemented in Malta with the use of EU funds? So, since 2008, we've had around slightly more than 500 successful projects which have received assistance from us, which amount to slightly over 70 million euros. Um, so that is the kind of 
projects that we've had assistance. Three very popular projects that we are particularly proud of. Um, one of them is um, the pro four projects which the MFA has implemented and is currently also implementing. Um, this project were, um, were across four different years and focused on the integration of refugees through sport, primarily with, re with regard to MFA through football. Right, and that's the video we saw just now yes. of the play football, live football. Yes. And aside from that for, um, uh, project, they had three other projects of a similar nature, um, two of which are still implementing currently. They've had certain delays with COVID, but everyone, unfortunately, but I'm sure those, those projects will be implemented successfully. And they focused on um, how to integrate um, uh, ref um, refugees um, uh, through sports, teaching right. them English, Maltese. Maltese society. Exactly. Right, exactly. And also they developed a number of uh, small amateur football clubs, so these okay. they, they can also have somewhere mm -hmm. to play football. Um, there's, a K, there's a K9 unit as well. Yes, right? well, that's a popular project that has been, um, I think, one of the most successful projects that we've had because it's very, very popular in Malta, this K9 unit. Um, we've helped the customs uh, department apply and successfully get rewarded for funding to establish its K9 unit. Its K9 unit is now is very, it's, it's very strong. It's one of the strongest tools I think the customs department has. It's, very, it's featured constantly in the news with right. the number Every of fines. You, you, you see it, a, exactly. a dog um, um, sniffed sniff wherever there is, undeclared cash and Exactly, stuff, so. and they, they've managed, they, they've been very successful. And now their K9 unit has, has also, they've also gotten funding from to, to support locally as mm -hmm. well as to, to further grow it. Mm -hmm. And it was good, it's, that was a good kind of one of our po prime roles that we were at the, at the right. start of this. Right. Um, and then uh, kind of to show also um, the range of projects that we also helped, we also helped um, Dean Lartelwa mm -hmm. um, with a number of projects, but one of the most successful projects as well, um, they were rewarded funding um, to restore the Delamara Lighthouse. Right. And the, kind of those are three kind of projects, although um, had a number, but they range from funding, which is um, administered locally, so the competition is local, but also in the case of the MFA project and also the customs project, where the comp where the application process was with the commission. So, so EUI, it was so it was EUI. So those were two in that in the case of MFA, four projects and the customs one project where they competed um, at a new level. So the competition was against projects in France, right. Germany, right. and uh, that's you that's the process becomes much more difficult because you're applying um, uh, with projects of a larger, of a larger nature mm -hmm. and countries of a larger stature. So, so obviously we've mentioned um, NGOs and, and organizations and stuff, but let's say for example, uh, me as a private individual, mm -hmm. are there any cause that I could benefit from if I have a project, a business, uh, an, 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 an idea to develop? Are there a cause that I as a private individual can apply yes, for? Um, so when it comes to funding cause, they, they focus on the specific sector, so it's a, if it's an environmental sector or educational sector or businesses. So you do find um, costs across all these different sectors, right. um, and then it has to be kind of what kind of your interest is. If you're a business, there are costs for businesses. Um, if you're in the creative sector, there are costs for for um, applicants in the creative sector. Um, environment, there's also quite a lot of. Um, uh, funding available and also when it comes to um, the education mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, more than not, though, you would, um, it would need to be through your organization. So you would have okay. a business, um, an NGO, and you would apply through your organization, but the goal would be to implement something through your organization. When it comes to individuals, there are certain opportunities, and um, they tend to be more towards the business, towards the business area where you'd be someone self-employed, right. would have a business like that. Um, uh, there are opportunities there, right? Yes. There's opportunities for everyone in Malta to kind of benefit from these EU funds. Yes. Um, as long as you have a really good idea and matches the call, exactly. then, then you can find it. But then the question is then, how do you apply for EU funds? Like you said, mentioned before, it was a daunting process. What is the exact process here in Malta? If I have a good idea, who do I speak to? Mm -hmm. Where can I keep track of all these calls coming out? Do I reach out to you? Or yeah. So this first, the first step, uh, can we, can be that anyone can come up to us. So when it comes to provision of information, we provide information. We provide the information to everyone, um, be it an individual, a business, um, an NGO. We provide the information to everyone. We can see with them what their ideas are, and we can suggest what opportunities are available now. If there is anything available now, we can guide them to see maybe what there, can, there might be in, in the coming months, right. so they can prepare as well. Um, then when it comes to um, the hands-on. Um, application process where we provide that, that assistance. 
Um, we are only limited to provide assistance to NGOs and public entities. But when it comes to the information, we at can at least guide uh, individuals and businesses mm -hmm. to what the first step. Look, if I'm this call for you, I like to, we recommend that you try and apply, and then they can at least have an idea where the, where the first step is and the, where they can start the application process. Um, uh, and then kind of they can see um, the pro start doing the process themselves. And and would the funds cover the whole project itself, or is it a, like a, a partial? It it would it would depend on the call. For example, in the case of the customs project, it, it the call focused on not just the canine unit, but also on the training that the the, the, per, the, the person is needed. So not just on the on getting the the dog, the sniffer dogs and their their the dogs is training, but also on the persons that would. Um, be with with the right, dogs. Right. Um, in certain cases, for certain inf infrastructure projects, um, they can select a part. A project can be focused on a particular phase of that infrastructure project. Um, it can vary across a different call. Each call has its own uh, particular um, style, let's say, and structure. Um, and so it would vary across the different call that would they would find that would match your project idea. Absolutely. Um, Andrea, it seems like, you know, it tends to be overlooked at times that, yes. you know, being a member of the EU has all these benefits. I don't think a lot of people are aware of all mm -hmm. these calls and projects, but at least with SEM, they can reach out to you and seek help, guidance, and even in some cases, if you're an uh, NGO mm -hmm. or organization, even um, help with the application form. So if they want to reach out, if they want to get in touch, mm -hmm. you have your website, your phone, your email, it's, yes. uh, it's all communication. So available. kind of our website is sem.gov.mt um, and also they can call us on 2200-3300. We have an office in Valletta, right in front of, in, in Republic Street, right in front of BOV. Mm -hmm. And we also have an office in Gozo in Shokia. Um, so we kind of, for, for persons in Gozo, we also have um, an executive there who can also assist them. Um, on anything right now, um, uh, in-person meetings are somewhat limited due to COVID, but we, are, we, we yeah. can easily do meetings virtually. Um, uh, and so with the process, we have not stopped providing our service through, through the COVID situation. Andrea, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Everyone out there, if you have a cool project uh, in mind that could benefit from EU funding, and you now know who to contact, um, even in the future, if something crops up, um, these, these government organizations are here to help, and we are a member of the EU, so we take full advantage of that. Andrea, thanks for coming in today, and for everyone tuning in, have a day full of loving. Thank you.